This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, one and all. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My goodness, today is December the 20th, and if you haven't got your Christmas shopping done by now, you better get it done. Man, I was at Lime Ridge Mall tonight getting uh, Laura her Christmas gift, and it was, it was wall-to-wall people. I, I, you know, you, you hear so many people complain about the economy, but gosh, come at Christmas time, Man, the people are out there. I just don't know what to make of things anymore. I really don't. So anyway, uh, this is our final show before the Christmas break, so I'd like to take this opportunity of wishing each and every one of you out there a very Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, you know, Happy Holidays, the very best of spirituality, love, health, and happiness to each and every one of you. My guest this hour is no other person that I would like to finish off before the holidays, and that is my good friend Howard Bloom. His website is www.howardbloom.net, and he's got a new book out, surprisingly, just in time for Christmas. This guy is a marketing guru. Uh, (laughs) Howard Bloom's book, How I Accidentally Started the 60s. Now, if anybody knows Howard Bloom, you know that anything anything Howard does isn't accidental, But Howard, welcome back to the show. Congratulations on yet another great book. And to you, your family, your friends and associates, the very best of the season. You too. My best to you and Laura. May you have a wonderful and absolutely fabulous new year. Well, thank you very much, my good friend. Uh, So uh, Big Apple is known around the world for its New Year's uh, festivities in Times Square. Um, How do you partake? Well, I normally sit at home uh, with my girlfriend Mm-hmm. And we watched the ball drop on television. Yeah. And last year she brought me all kinds of little noisemakers that you flip around in the air <laughs> and party hats and stuff like that. But unfortunately, she had, well, she had a problem. We had a problem in February. She died, poor baby. Oh, my, and, my condolences. But she lived, she lived to 70. So oh, that God was a reasonably good run. Yeah. And especially given that her mother and her sister both died at the age of 43. Oh, so God. I have a friend who is an actress, mm-hmm. and, ev- and, and we periodically go on movie nights. Uh-huh. So we will go to a theater as close to Times Square as we can get, um, and we will... Uh, sit there and hold hands, we'll watch a movie, we'll watch The Darkest Hour, the Winston Churchill movie, the woman who plays, uh, the actress who plays Winston Churchill's wife, Mm -hmm. who was a tremendously important person in his life, and thus a tremendously important person in history, is Kristen Scott Thomas. Wow. And Kristen Scott Thomas and I were introduced a long time ago by Prince. Prince said, you have to sit down with this guy for four hours and go through his training, and so Kristen and I Scott, sat down together, and, and there I was face-to-face with one of the re- most remarkable people I had ever, ever 
met in my life. And remember, I've worked with people like Prince and Michael yeah. Jackson, and Billy Buck Joel, Aldrin, Sticks, and yeah, all kinds of remarkable mm-hmm. people. And yet, Chris and Scott Thomas really stood out. And a couple of days ago, there was a 20 second little uh, blip of the film on a television show I was watching. And even in that 20 seconds, Chris and Scott Thomas's performance is extraordinary. So I will go to the movie and then and we will hold hands and we will giggle and I'll drop my friend, the actress, off at her home. Eventually, we might walk 30 or 40 blocks Mm -hmm. and then I will go straight home to my laptop and I will tell Chris and Scott Thomas in an email just how splendid and wonderful she was in this movie. That's what, the plan. What a guy. <laughs> Exonation Howard Bloom is an American author. He was the publicist in the 1970s and 1980s for singers and bands such as Prince, Billy Joel, and Styx in 1988. He became disabled and uh, with a chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, Howard, I remember those days. And it's so good hearing you, my friend. And, you know, uh, whenever Howard gets on the phone with me, whether on air or off air, I ask him a very simple simple question, like how many push-ups. And he was telling me today he did in excess of 650 push-ups. <laughs> At the age of 74, Rob. You're as and, old, you're only and as, I, have, mm-hmm. I have to tell your listeners, back in the I was stuck in a bed for yeah. 15 years. It was a monstrous, hideous, horrible experience. And Rob McConnell helped save me because periodically Rob and I would get together on the phone and we would do an hour or so, yeah. sometimes more. And we did it over and over again. And that human contact and the warmth that I got from Rob was so vital to my life that you you can't possibly imagine it. God bless you, my friend. I didn't do that much. I just, I I fully enjoy our friendship that we've cultivated over the many years. And you, Howard Bloom, have touched so many, so many people in so many ways that I don't even think you, the guy who accidentally started the 60s, will ever know the amount of hearts that you've touched in a positive way. Well, thanks, Rob. I mean, I, I, that's what I live for. Yeah. And you never know as an individual human being whether you're succeeding if you set a very high goal mm-hmm. for yourself at all. So, But the, how I suddenly yeah. started the 60s, the, I didn't set out to, set, to, to start the 60s, not by any stretch of the imagination. I, I was uh, isolated in, uh, in Buffalo, New York. I had no friends. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. Why? Uh, my, my parents wanted to have nothing to do with me. I was a little intellectual geek. Oh. I can't catch a ball. I can't bat a ball. I can't throw a ball. I can't do any of the normal things that kids can do. But, you know, that when I was 10 years old, I got into microbiology and theoretical physics. And by the time I was 12, I I'd built my first Boolean algebra machine. And uh-huh. I had co-designed a computer that won national science or, or local science fair awards. And I'd had a meeting with the head of the graduate physics department. I was 12 years old, Rob. Well, look at how times have changed, my friend. The number one show on television these days is The Big Bang. Yes, that's true. And that's what we were discussing. That's right. I and the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo. But eventually, Time Magazine, which I read from cover to cover, started cover started doing these stories that were really designed so that men in gray flannel suits, remember those? Mm-hmm. Uh, the guys who all lived out in Connecticut and came in every day by train to Manhattan and yeah. worked in ad agencies and stuff like that and all dressed identically. Well... Time magazine needed to have something that would give them sexual access somehow. So it came up with the idea of covering this group of bohemians who were into free love. And that group of bohemians was the beatniks. So every issue had to have a story about what the beatniks were up to. So you could get vicarious sexual pleasure by saying that you really disapproved of this free love stuff. And um, I was reading about the beatniks and it sounded to me like if I was ever able to get anywhere near them, they would accept me. They'd be the first people in my life that would accept me. So when I went out to Reed College in Portland, Oregon in 1961 by train, eventually I got really into pursuing Zen Buddhist Satori, the Zen Buddhist form of enlightenment, which was big with beatniks. And I dropped out of school, and I hitchhiked from uh, actually from Seattle all the way down to San Francisco um, because I was trying to find the beatniks. They were all supposed to be at North Beach. Uh, they were all supposed to be at the City Lights Bookstore, which was founded by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who was one of the key four key poets of the beat movement. And the opening chapter of How I Suddenly Started in the 60s is about how I was picked up by four murderers and 
I mean, they were going to give me, they were very generous. They were going to give me a ride all the way from Eugene, Oregon, something like 750 miles to San Francisco. And as a hitchhiker, you seldom get the privilege of a ride that long that takes you exactly where you need to, you need to go. But for the first half hour in the car, they looked like extras from the Night of the Living Dead. It was at <laughs> night. And I tried to, you know, I was very good at getting people's stories out of them. Yeah. And then the line with which you get a story out of a person is, well, what do you do for a living? That opens the conversation. Well, I asked that several times. There wasn't a word from any of these three guys. And it was a peculiar car. It was a Hudson. If you remember Hudson's, it was black. It was like a hearse. And in the back seat, there were four stacks of cases of beer. There was barely room. I had to pull my knees up against my chest in order to sit there. And so they didn't say a word for a half an hour, which is really unusual when you're hitchhiking. Yeah. And then one of them opened his mouth and said, do you mind a little heater action? Well, you know, Rob, Cal it's Northern California by now. And Northern California is freezing at night. So, of course, I didn't mind a little heater action. But nobody reached for the switch to turn on the heater. And I wondered what was going on. And then it occurred to me, back in the early 1950s, Guns. there was a show called Dragnet. Yeah. Um, and in Dragnet, a heater meant a gun. Mm -hmm. So this black Hudson <laughs> pulled up to a little convenience store. And in those days, convenience stores were made of unpainted wood. And the wood was graying and about to fall apart. And they carried everything from spark plugs and extension cords to pork and beans and uh, two guys got out of the car and went in and the other one kept the motor running mm. and i expected to see blood spurting from the forehead of the little old man behind the counter and i expected to see him splayed back against the pork and beans knocking a couple off the shelf as he slumped <laughs> to the floor and nothing like that happened and the two guys came out of the store muttering and grumbling when they got back into the car, they finally said something. They were trying to pull a quick change routine, and they were trying to give the guy a 20 and get change for a 100. Yeah. And instead, they gave him a 20 and they got change for a 10. He <laughs> outboxed them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they started to introduce who they were. Uh -huh. And it turned out the guy sitting on the, my immediate left um, was a con artist. Well, if he's a con artist, Rob... Um, what kind of living could this guy possibly make when he can't even pull off a quick change routine at an isolated rural um, convenience store? Good question. And, and the other two were murderers. They were from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the robbery of fur vaults was their specialty. In those days, furs were worth a lot of money. Rich women hadn't turned against furs yet. And, uh, and they were all out on bail uh, for some giant fur heist. And they were heroin addicts and they were headed for San Francisco because the supply of heroin had dried up in Vancouver. And they were hoping that in San Francisco, they'd be able to score some dope. And we me with my strange appearance, long, curly hair of a kind no one's seen on a male and since Harpo Marx wore his wig and barefoot <laughs> um, and wearing a white sweater so that at night I could hitchhike and people wouldn't run me down but would see me by the side of the road. Uh -huh. uh, they thought that maybe I would know where the drugs were. Well, yeah, I knew where the drugs are. They're a drugstore. You take two aspirin and call me in the morning. <laughs> that, that was my idea of drugs. So they started telling the stories of all of the people they had murdered. All right, we're going to have to have a cliffhanger here because I've got to take my break. Howard Bloom is our special guest. www.howardbloom.net. We're talking to Howard about his book, new book this hour, entitled Howard Bloom, How I Accidentally Started the 60s. Other books by Howard include The Lucifer Principle, The God Problem, The Genius of the Beast, and global brain. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue hearing the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Merry Christmas, everyone. Do you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, 
X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www. XZBN.net Howard Bloom is our special guest to this hour, Exxon Nation, www.howardbloom.net. And as I said, Howard uh, is an American author. He was a publicist in the 1970s and 1980s for such greats. And uh, not only in, in independent artists, but also bands such as Prince, Billy Joel, and Styx. And uh, he is also the author of many books. And uh, four of my personal favorites are The Lucifer Principle, The God Problem, The Genius of the Beast, and a Global Brain. Now, Howard has a brand new book that is out. And this is so Howard. This is so Howard. The title is How I Accidentally Started the 60s. Howard Bloom is my guest, a good friend. And once again, to you and yours, Howard, the very best of the season. Thanks, Rob. And the same to you and Laura. Okay. I, okay. Okay. As I see it, you're in this car with right. two murderers. And a con murder, two murderers and a con man. And a con yes, man exactly. who couldn't con an old man in the middle of nowhere uh, and got conned himself. And yes. you're on the way to San Francisco to score some heroin because these Canadians are out on probation or on par- par- parole from a fur ho- heist. And Vancouver is dried up. So they're going to, to San Francisco with their hitchhiker who looks like... Well, I'm not going to say Harpo Marx. Uh, but you look, you, you <laughs> if, look a little bit like... you can like, imagine Jiminy Cricket wearing a Harpo Marx wig, okay, uh, the, you've got it. Okay, so, so please continue, because this is a riot. So they tell me the stories of all of their murders because they are trying to show how macho they are. Uh-huh. And when they finish with that, they run out of conversation. But they know they haven't proven their case that they are these superheroes. Mm-hmm. So they switch over to the subject of... I'm not sure we get we're allowed to say this on on radio, but they switch over to the subject of oral sex. Oh. And they compare the, the, the acrobatic lingual techniques, tongue <laughs> techniques, of <laughs> all of them that they've ever been involved with in uh-huh. this particular manner in Vancouver, trying to determine who has the most athletic mouth in the entire Northwest Pacific of Canada. <laughs> um, and uh, our prime and minister, goes, Justin Trudeau. Yeah. So all of this stuff occupies about an hour and a half to two hours. But it's uh-huh. a long trip, 750 miles to San Francisco. And we're still in the middle of nowhere in Northern California. And they run out of conversation. So I have made sandwiches that morning before embarking on my trip to San Francisco by thumb hitchhiking. Mm-hmm. And I offer them sandwiches. And they ask me what I've got. And I explain that I have cream cheese and smoked oysters. And after gagging a little bit, <laughs> they don't seem to find this particularly appetizing. Uh-huh. And then I explain how I obtained the smoked oysters. And much as, you know, my first rule of life is the truth at any price, including the price of your life. But here, here I am with a group of people who are beginning to follow me around as I'm seeking the beatniks and seeking Satori. And I've got to feed them. And I've got about a dollar thirty-five in my pocket. So somebody teaches me how to shoplift. I hate to admit that. (laughs) So I go to the grocery store preparing for my trip to San Francisco, Uh and I buy uh, a quart of milk, and I buy a loaf of bread, and then I take cream cheese and smoked oysters and other small items in my jockstrap, 
um, as a donation from the Brits. Okay. <laughs> So, oh, you know, you so, kind of, you kind of had me thinking you were a, a Forrest Gump there for a while. As uh, you know, as he was running across America, he had people following him. Right. Uh, yeah, but I, 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 you know, like the the cream cheese and the oysters and the jock strap just kind of blew that image out of my mind. Okay. Well, my group of followers, <laughs> I did have a group of followers, but then I caught a cold, and we were uh, all going to go by freight train illegally riding the rails okay. down to Berkeley together. Uh-huh. So they left me with a leaking uh, pitcher of orange juice <laughs> um, and and a couple of sandwiches on a bare naked wood floor in a student dormitory <sighs> where the, the dishes hadn't been washed. Every single dish was in the sink. And they've been growing fungus and mold for, for the last six <laughs> months. Because, you know, students, they're not going to pick up a dish and wash yeah. it. Um, so I was in this eco-friendly, you know, a whole ecosystem in the sink place before we, uh, and they all left me, and I had to proceed to San Francisco on my own when uh-huh. I got over the cold, which is why I was alone with these murders. Right. So when I explained how I had transported the smoked oysters, <laughs> there was no way in hell these guys were going to touch any of my sandwiches, and first. All of a sudden, these guys who prided themselves on putting bullets into other people's brains went into action like an emergency medical unit. They perceived that I was a person in crisis, that they were about to lose my soul, that I was living a life without meaning, that I was living a life that was so unstructured that I would go down to purgatory and the hell beyond it at any second if they didn't catch me. And they spent the next two hours lecturing me on the fact that you must have a purpose in your life. <laughs> and in addition to a purpose in your life, you must have a woman in your life. Yeah, like uh, the women that you were cheating on with all of these women <laughs> with acrobatic mouths up in Vancouver. I mean, are you kidding? Uh, but the amazing thing, Rob, was that despite all of the things that they had done, all mm-hmm. of the antisocial things they had done, at heart, they were concerned. They were genuinely concerned uh, that at any moment they could lose me. And they were out there fighting with all the energy they had to save me. It was one of the most remarkable wow. turnarounds I've ever seen in my life. And it, it left a basic message. And that message was that no matter how awful a person may be or yeah. seem, somewhere inside of him there is decency. There really is honor among thieves. By that the, by the way, Howard, I've this uh, this portion of the show is being brought to you by the province of British Columbia and all the women of the city of Vancouver. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Ah, if only there were an Olympics <laughs> for this, but there is. Yeah, so, the, the so pole, you know, is, pole pole dancing isn't that an Olympic sport, Craig? It no, is yes. And so I arrived. I finally arrived in San Francisco, mm-hmm. and I found my followers who were ensconced in Berkeley. And then I went into North Beach, which is where all the beatniks were supposed to be. Uh-huh. And I went into the City Lights bookstore, which was supposed to be the Vatican of the beatnik movement. And there were no customers in there whatsoever. There was one guy behind the counter. I asked him timidly, look, Rob, I didn't look normal. You'd think he'd at least look up from whatever he was reading, but he didn't. And I asked him where the beatniks were, and he acted as if I wasn't even there. Oh, my gosh. So I walked out looking really confused because the beatniks (laughs) were the people I I, I had imagined would accept me. And if they were there to accept me, who else ever would? I mean, I was, of course, not registering the fact that I had a group of followers who had come down with me. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I was in a a state of deep trouble and somebody walking down the sidewalk. This is another instance of the kindness uh, in the hearts of most of us human beings said, you look like you're troubled. Can I help you with something? And I said, yes, I'm looking for the beatniks. And he rolled his eyes up into his forehead and he thought really hard and he scratched his head. And finally, he said, well, um, have you tried Colorado? <laughs> and that's a little too vague of a destination for my hitchhiking and riding the rails uh. abilities. So, so what actually happened was I accidentally helped start the 60s in 1962 mm-hmm. because the beatniks were gone. I was seeking the beatniks. And in the process of seeking the beatniks in Zen Buddhist Satori, I developed a group of followers. We developed our own lifestyle. And then eventually I left and uh, and left the country for a while. And when I came back, 
guess who had given my movement a name? That is the movement of my followers. Uh, it, Time Life. Wow. Time Magazine, the very same magazine what? that had given me the beatniks on a weekly basis. What did they call and, your movement? They called us the hippies. Oh, I would have called you the late bloomers. <laughs> <laughs> Get it? Bloom? Bloomers? Okay. Yes, exactly. Sorry. And they and they called us this mm-hmm. before the Merry Pranksters, uh, before Timothy Leary, um, before LSD made the cover of every magazine in sight. Because that stuff didn't start happening until 1964 and 1965. And when you're 19 years old, two years makes a big difference. Oh, it sure does. It sure does. So My I, Lord. what I did was help catalyze. I'm sure I was not the only one with followers out there. There were probably other people in some way looking for the beatniks or looking for Zen Buddhist Satori or looking for something roughly equivalent thereof. So where did you, did, you, did you hang around Hate ashbury well, actually, we moved eventually. First, we, we moved. First, we were looking for an apartment. Yeah. And, uh, and we got so desperate that we just started knocking on doors at random. We went up a flight of stairs to where the, par- the apartments were above the stores on Telegraph Avenue and knocked on the first door. Our intention was to knock on a whole bunch of doors, but we never got past the first door. Um, we asked the guy who opened the door, who looked like a character out of Dickens because he was ruddy faced and so healthy looking, <laughs> was ridiculous with dark black hair and, and really radiant eyes. And um, we told him we were looking for an apartment. And he said, well, why don't you stay with me? Now, the problem was that he was a student at Berkeley and he had an apartment about the size of a closet. And his girlfriend was already there draped across the floor. And there was barely any room for any of us to stand, much less all of us. There were about five of us at mm-hmm. that point. Now, you, you would have had a scotch tape us to the ceiling um, <laughs> to give us room. Um, and, but nonetheless, we took him up on his offer, and we lived in his apartment for a little while. Mm-hmm. And then, while I was hitchhiking off in San Pedro, my my gang found a uh, a big pink condemned house about two blocks away. And we didn't care if the house was supposed to fall down. It looked solid to us. So we moved in, and we stopped wearing clothes, and we became so accustomed to walking around naked that it was very hard to remind ourselves that we, if we showed up, in the clothing we were wearing, which was nothing at the local supermarket, <laughs> we might have certain difficulties. Um, we just developed our way of life, and people, uh, the, the most oh strangest God. thing that happened was somehow, it was the days before social media. It was the days before the Internet. It was the days before having a phone you could wear on your hip. So, so, so Howard, are you also telling me that not only are you one of the developers of the hippie movement, but you were actually one of the first squatters? <laughs> well, I'm sure other people have been squatting, but yes, there we were squatting and naked at that. Uh. So, so at any rate, these kids from Virginia, the University of Virginia, heard about us, dropped out of the University of Virginia, got in a little red MG sports car. Remember oh those? I sure do. And, um, and drove all the way across the country, 2,500 miles, and found us in the big pink condemned house in Berkeley. So we must have had more of a reputation than I would have realized at the time. Um, so that's the beginning of, of how I accidentally started the 60s. In fact, people still thought it was the 50s, and the 60s wouldn't wake up to its own unique identity until two years later, 1964. Um, and and I was there for that, and then there are the things that happened during the Summer of Love, because that was the summer for me of the Great Polygamy Experiment, which is a whole different story. And it goes on. 1964, the Beatles? Um, 1964 was the Beatles. It was Timothy Leary. It was the Merry Pranksters. Uh, it was the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Um, it was the year when there was a band serenading the Merry Pranksters at their parties where they spiked all of the bowls of um, uh, punch mm-hmm. with LSD. Uh, the band that was playing would later call itself the Grateful Dead. That was the big turnaround year, and and we helped inadvertently, accidentally, we helped establish the roots. Exonation. Howard Bloom is our special guest. He's the author of How I Accidentally Started the 60s. And uh, if you'd like to find out more about Howard or if you'd like to get a copy of his book, his website is www.howardbloom.net. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on the Exxon Broadcast Network. 
Digital Satellite Network, Digital Broadcast Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and our good friends at ICE, at iHeart Radio. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Howard Bloom is my guest of this hour, Exonation, www.howardbloom.net. And um, talking to Howard about his new book entitled How I Accidentally Started the 60s. Now, I've also was, uh, thanks to Howard, I was sent a link to Forbes magazine who did a fantastic article on, on Howard. And if you'd like to read it, go to Forbes' website. The article is done by Simon Constable. It's a great article. And this is one of the many articles that I've seen over the years talking to Howard that truly gives him due justice for the great work that he's done. Once again, his website is www.howardbloom.net. All right, Howard, let me try and do a fast recap here. Um, Here you are, a young boy with a vision, and somehow you got to, you're going to hitchhike down to San Francisco and you got picked up by these three gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, two were <laughs> two were murderers, and one was a con artist from Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, they were driving a dark Hudson. Uh, let me see. And as you're going along, they got into conversations about oral sex and the Sex Olympics and so other other such, you know, topics that young men would talk about on a trip to San Francisco, as if I know that for a fact. But anyway, it sounds good. So. You were telling us earlier that you would. Well, let me let me get a little further ahead. Then, I guess the part I want to get to is where you were squatting in a house, and you and your followers found it more comfortable to walk around naked. And there were times when you had to remember that you were naked, especially if you were going to go shopping. Now, here's my question: Is that when your shoplifting career stopped because you weren't wearing a jock strap anymore? <laughs> Very, very good question. Um, no, it didn't, because when we were planning a trip to Big Sur, um, uh-huh. by now there were about 10 of us, and um, somebody was going to have to provide the food for three or four days uh-huh. on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Well, guess who was particularly expert in providing food and then cooking it for everybody? I was. Uh-huh. So I went off to the local supermarket, as usual, clothed Oh, clothed. Time. That's good. That's good. Okay. Yes, and with my jock strip. So I was able to supply 10 people with food for three days through a combination of buying a few inexpensive items uh-huh. and accepting the more expensive items as a donation. All right, I've got another question for you. How big was your jock strap? 
<laughs> Not very big, but you also get good at shoving uh, huge stakes uh, uh -huh. into the waistband of your pants. Oh, okay. Um, and wearing a great big baggy sweater and also outfoxing the security guys because the security guys start getting very suspicious about you and they start to try to make you nervous by being one uh, block of shelves away from you, about 30 to 40 feet away, but making it obvious that they're there. And the best way to spook them is to walk straight up to them and say, where do you keep the Worcester sauce? And the closer <laughs> you get to them, the more nervous, not just nervous, the more they seem to shrink in front of your very eyes. So, so I learned small bits of human psychology, and I apologize to all of us who try to, up, who try to live up to the highest ethical and moral standards all of our lives, because I certainly have done that most of my life for this, uh, this uh, what would you call it, a, a diversion. But, but isn't, it, is, isn't, it, isn't it Gandhi who said a man must do what a man must do? I'm not quite sure, and I wouldn't normally agree, but under the circumstances, yeah. I obviously did something I, under normal circumstances, would have disapproved of. But, but the strange yeah. thing about this book, Rob, is that I wrote the first draft of this book when I was sick in bed. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was isolated from other human beings, and I was literally too weak to talk. Yeah. And it was a, and nobody else could be in the room with me. I had to be in the room all by myself. And it was hideously painful. And two things pulled me out of that pain. And they were the works of Dave Barry and P.G. Wodehouse. Because humor, what it's effectively done, and these guys were brilliant at it, can lift you up to a virtual reality that makes you forget all of the difficulties in the reality around you. So in order to hold on to friends, which mm -hmm. is very difficult to do when you can't talk and you're very, very sick and you've disappeared from the industry, you were a legend in, I started writing up these episodes of how I suddenly started the 60s. And I wrote them to try to achieve the kind of exalted standards of humor that P.G. Wodehouse and Dave Barry had achieved. And when I finished it, I ended up sending it, well, I, I tracked down my friend Eric Gardner because I wanted to get it to the Jefferson Airplane, who'd been a quintessential 60s band. Yeah. He used to be, he started his career as a road manager for them. And, and then since then, he's managed all kinds of acts. And when I contacted him, when I sent him a snail mail, because in those days, very few people had email, um, I got back a message that said, Howard, I've got somebody much better to get it to. Please send me the manuscript. And he got the manuscript to, of all people, Timothy Leary. Oh, gosh. And about three weeks later, I got back a quote, and it went like this. This is a monumental, epic, glorious literary achievement. Every page, every paragraph, every sentence sparkles with captivating metaphors, delightful verbal concoctions, alchemical insights, philosophic whimsy, absurd illogicals, scientific comedy routines, relentless, nonstop waves of hilarity. The comparisons to James Joyce are inevitable and undeniable. Finnegan's wake wanders through the rock and roll 60s. Wow, woo, wild, wonderful. And I thought that my friend Eric had made this up and then gotten Timothy Leary to approve using it. I didn't believe it really came from Timothy Leary. And, and many years later, two friends, one of them is Douglas Rushkoff, the author of books like Coercion, um, showed up at my, the foot of my bed because I was still stuck in bed. And so I printed out two copies of this quote because I kept a printer next to the bed since I really couldn't get much further than the bed. Mm -hmm. um, and I handed each of them a copy of this. Why? Because they had spent the last six months of Timothy Leary's life sitting with him. He was sick. He was very sick. Oh. And I had realized that. And uh, so what I realized, uh, first of all, I handed them the quote. And when they finished reading it, there was one of these deathly silences, absolute silence. And I knew exactly why. I knew it was because the quote was phony. And they were trying to think of a way to tell me without hurting my feelings. Oh. And then one of them opened his mouth and said, this is Tim. And you could hear the whole horrid experience of sitting there watching a friend die for six months that they had undergone and the whole loss of Timothy Leary in their voices. And then I realized something. This manuscript had reached Timothy Leary during the last six months of his life when he was dying of prostate cancer. One person in a bed who was hideously sick had reached out to another person in a bed who was hideously sick 
with the goal of wafting anyone who read those pages into an exalted plane of virtual reality of absolute humor. And apparently it had worked. It had taken Timothy Leary out of his pain and out of his emotional agony for whatever amount of time it had taken him to read it. Six hours, nine hours. It was a breathtaking thing to realize, Rob. It, it, it was very moving. Wow. That is. That truly is. So, and then the, the quote from Simon Constable was also extremely gratifying because, you know, I try to do, I'm literally working on 16 projects simultaneously right now. Oh, you've, you've slowed down, eh? Mission. Yeah, I'm co-designing yeah. a multiplanetary mission at Caltech. Um, what else am I doing? I keep a list here because it's, I think of them one at a time and it's impossible to think of them all in a group. But um, you know that I just, um, I co-founded and I chaired the Asian Space Technology Summit in Kuala Lumpur. Um, I am working on, there's a film being made about my life by a two-time Emmy winner named Charlie Hoxie. It's a 60 to 90 minute documentary. Um, and uh, the how I accidentally started the 60s of being shopped in Hollywood by Biederman Owens Productions. And I'm doing this thing that Barbara Marks Hubbard, the, the grandmother of the New Age movement, calls co-creating genius with her and Mark Gaffney. Um, we've recorded probably about 20 hours so far and a whole bunch of other things. And, uh, I mean, there's a guy in Texas who's giving a course based on the God problem. There's a guy in Scotland who's turning a document I wrote that's a manifesto for the future of humanity and life called Garden the Solar System, Green the Galaxy, into an animation. Another person is turning it into what will become a book. So I'm doing all of these things. And to hear from Simon, he says, by any standards, Howard Bloom has achieved great things. Um, Scientist, publicist, and author barely begin to describe it. His latest book, How I Suddenly Started the 60s, adds mightily to the oeuvre. So great is his body of work that it would be easy for even a superbly accomplished individual to read the bio at the back of his recently published book and come away with a general feeling of inferiority. Don't let that put you off. Um, how I Suddenly Started the 60s is the beautiful story of Howard Bloom, and it is hilarious. That takes your breath away. Because when you're an author and you finish writing a book, you have no idea of whether anybody is going to understand it, appreciate it, um, even going to touch it. And so getting this kind of feedback from a fellow human being, and in the pages of Forbes, no less, it validates the, the idea of doing 16 projects simultaneously and trying to basically leave a role model behind that allows other kids who are as lost as I was when I was 10 to build a life that's a Leonardo da Vinci life, but in the modern era. Let me ask you, Howard, now when you look back in time to that young boy that was hitchhiking his way down to, um, to San Francisco, did you have any idea what lied ahead in your life? Um, no, not really. All I knew was I was on a mission, and I knew the mission was important, and I knew from William mm -hmm. James and his varieties of the religious experience, which I'd read when I was 14 years old, that if you are going to accomplish anything heroic in life, you must go to the very edges of the normal yeah. and step out into the abnormal, into the land of the insane, and take the things you learn about insanity, about things beyond the land of the normal, and haul them into normal life. And if you do, those beasts of insanity can become the engines of historical change. Or the genius of the beast? Yes, you got it. You got it, Rob. <laughs> Howard, uh, we've got to take our commercial break coming up very shortly. But when we do, my friend, I would like to get... It's been a while since you and I talked. And, right. And um, I'd like to get your comments or your bloom... Uh, what are we going to call it? Howardisms. I like that. Howardisms. I'd like to get your Howardisms on what's happening in Washington these days. Oy vey. Oy vey. <laughs> right. Oy vey. That's a good Hebrew name. Yeah. Right. All right. Let's get the matzo bread and the oibes going and, and enjoy ourselves. Howard, always great talking to you, my friend. Congratulations on your, on your book, uh, How I Accidentally Started the 60s. Mind Thanks, you, Rob. I've known you so many years, my friend. I don't think you've ever done anything accidentally. <laughs> and we'll come back on the other side of this break with Howard Bloom. And if you'd like to uh, find out more about Howard, get a copy of any of his great books. Like I said, Explanation, my four favorite are The Lucifer Principle, The God Problem, 
The Genius of the Beast, and Global the global brain. What is the name of you? You had one that you switched the name on us. Um, oh, what could that be? I mean, the only other book left is there's uh, the Muhammad Code. How that's a desert it. prophet brought you. Yeah, that's how it. a desert prophet brought you ISIS, Al Qaeda, and Boko Haram, or how Muhammad invented jihad. And Rob, I think that is a profoundly important book. Well, let's talk about that as well on the other side. Exo Nation, Howard Bloom, www.howardbloom.net. And we'll return as we wrap up this hour here in the Exome from our broadcast center in beautiful Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. is under ever-increasing pressure from untenable lifestyles and growing populations. Yet, viable answers seem in short supply. What if I told you there's an ancient form that can empower you to take charge of your life? What if your entire family could be enfolded and supported by life itself, finding safe passage through challenging times? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Art School with Great News, an upcoming series of leading-edge online affordable classes based in an ancient form of shamanism easily learned and used by your entire family. Galactic Shamanism, Art of the Ancients, Key to Tomorrow are a series of online adult and children's lessons instructing your entire family on natural law, how to cooperate with and be supported by the powers of the universe. Visit findyourpathhome.com to find these unique and powerful classes. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I have no idea why Craig uh, used that bumper. <laughs> I have no idea, Craig. Oh, I see. He's telling me it's because of, of all the suspense that that was built up in his little. I'm, I, I can't. I, I. You know what? Saying the word "mind" and Craig together just doesn't work. But anyway, <laughs> no, poor Craig. Yeah. Um, all right. I've got to get you right into this. Donald Trump. We are into the Trump era, and it's profoundly disturbing, Rob. Yeah. Remember, the first rule, the, the two rules of my religion are the truth at any price, and, yeah. uh, including the price of your life, and look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. That first rule is the rule of courage, but truth. 
And Donald Trump makes statements like, I'm the most intelligent person ever to run for president of the United States. I have the best character of any person who's ever run for president of the United States. My tax bill is the biggest tax cut in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. And he's able to say these things because he doesn't know any history. And there's a simple phrase that you and I abide by. I, I've seen you go through fact, just fact checking so thorough. It's absolutely amazed me. Um, and I fact check everything five times or more. Yeah. Everything. This is a guy who's never heard the phrase fact checking. Or if he has heard it, heard it, it hasn't made a dent on him because he's so divorced from truth that it's ridiculous. So today we had the passage of what he claims is the biggest tax cut in history. Now, previous tax cuts have included the um, the Kennedy tax cut, which actually was enacted just after Kennedy was assassinated, um, and the Reagan tax cut. So I wanted to see what the history was of these tax cuts. Did they, in fact, improve the economy? Well, yes, both of those improved the economy. And they improved the economy because each one was implemented after a major economic downturn, after a recession. So the economy was going to come back with or without the tax cuts. And it's hard to tell whether the tax cuts made a difference, but let's assume that they did. Now, Donald Trump is enacting uh, a tax cut, which is one of the biggest in history. And um, the difficulty is that we did have a major economic downturn. It was the Great Recession of 2007 and 2008. We came out of it in approximately 2011. Mm -hmm. And since then, we've had 86 straight months of job growth and 86 straight months of economic growth. Now, if you go back to my book, The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism, which explains an awful lot of what underlies the cycle of boom and bust, you'll see that we have major depressions roughly every 60 years, and we have recessions. Remember those recessions? Yeah. We have recessions roughly every five years. So we are now eight years into the recovery from a great from a depression. We're misnaming it when we merely call it a recession. Um, and eight years is much longer than a recovery generally runs. So we are overdue for a recession. And Donald Trump is not going to experience um, the kind of automatic inflation of the economy that was experienced by uh, Johnson in implementing Kennedy's tax cut or Reagan because they came just as the economy was tanking. And so they were able to see the economy up and out of the tank. This is not something. Now, what was Donald Trump's one of Donald Trump's major reasons for being sued with Trump University? Fraud. He taught his his minions taught people how to invest when everything is going up. Mm -hmm. And but they never taught the students that things eventually go down and you have to be able to make it through a downturn. So. And Trump doesn't seem to be registering that eventually everything goes down. Let me so ask you. Let me, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So we're we're overdue for the next recession, and that could interrupt the plans for uh, a major tax cut to seemingly um, make the economy flourish um, in a considerable way. But we'll have to see. With all the controversy about Russia, the the part that Russia played in the last presidential election as well as what is going on in North Korea as well, you know, and apparently his lack of, of diplomacy when dealing with these countries. How has he remained in power? Well, he's remained in power because he was elected. Now, he wasn't elected in the standard way. Right. Um, he, he lost by three million votes. Mm -hmm. But through what he would have called a rigged system, and he did often call it a rigged yeah. system, the Electoral College, he's president. And in America, we accept our presidents um, because we elected them and we try to adhere to the system because if we, if we abandon the system, then we will abandon sanity and almost anything could happen. Of course, we have abandoned sanity. This is not a sane guy. He's a delusional narcissist. And, you know, we can sit down and do vast lists of all yeah. the things he said that are radically untrue, well, um, but which he believes with all his heart and soul. Apparently, uh, there, there's talk now that he is uh, considering letting uh, Robert Mueller go as independent counsel. Oh, it's not that. He's going to do his best to make it look like he's not firing Robert Mueller, while the Republicans um, 
make Rob Mueller look like the devil himself so that the American people want to belch him out like a cat belching out a furball. Mm -hmm. Um, So on paper, it will look as if Donald Trump didn't fire Robert Mueller. It's just that Robert Mueller was filled with scandal. Now, why is he filled with scandal? Because he fired somebody who he sensed had a bias against Donald Trump, and he sensed it on the basis of personal emails, which he shouldn't necessarily have had access to. He fired somebody. What does that mean about his moral compass? What does that mean about his commitment to being impartial in his investigation? It means he is very committed to being impartial, or he wouldn't have fired the guy. But the Republicans are seizing on this firing to imply that everybody at the FBI under or everybody on Mueller's team is prejudiced against Donald Trump and out to get him because they're all Democrats. And Democrats should be driven out of government because basically Democrats are anti they're anti-American. Um, that's the general mood in the Republican Party right now. Do you think uh, do you think Donald Trump did the right thing by letting uh, Director Comey go? Uh, No, I think he did the wrong thing. Um, He wanted all of the heads, the heads of the FBI, the head of the Justice Department, everybody. He wants them to, I'm not sure we're allowed to use this phrase on radio, but to kiss his tail. Okay. Um, And if they don't kiss up, if they don't just shower him with praises and tell him, him he's the most wonderful person on the face of the earth, then he wants them out. Because he wants that slavish loyalty, but it's more than slavish loyalty. This is a man who needs acknowledgement of his specialness, his greatness, the fact that he is unique in the universe from the people around him every single day. And he wasn't going to get that from Comey. That's what he was asking for from Comey. And Comey insisted on being on uh, upholding the ethics of, that he, as he saw it, of the FBI, which is to be impartial. I mean, look, he had helped Donald Trump get the election mm-hmm. by uh, torpedoing Hillary Clinton twice yeah. and once just a few days before the election itself. Donald Trump should have been grateful. But no, Donald Trump wants genuine flattery, no matter how dishonest it is, and he wants it every day. How dangerous is this last young lady that he fired? Or the, the media says he, she was fired. He says that she was like, oh, everything is amicable. And she is now saying uh, to other members of the media that she knows a lot, and when she's able to tell her story, it's going to sink him. Well, she's saying that because she wants to sell a book for a lot of money Mm -hmm. and set herself up at least for the next 10 years of her life. Um, It's a surely commercial um, goal that she's pursuing. So we'll have to see. Because, uh, look, the Russians apparently helped, and the Russians have had lots of people in both the Trump campaign and the Hillary Clinton campaign, but the Russians focused on torpedoing the Hillary Clinton campaign because they, because Putin hates Hillary Clinton. He thinks that she is trying to topple him. And so they had agents within the Democratic Party. The Russians gained access, apparently, Mm -hmm. to all of the emails of Hillary Clinton, and that caused a scandal. It lost her the presidency, even though she won by three million votes. What would have happened, Rob, if an equal number mm-hmm. of Donald Trump emails had been revealed to the public, how much scandal would that have caused? How many things will we have discovered in there that we thought were utterly insane? Well, I think we're starting to discover it now, especially with the investigation that uh, Robert Mueller is doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, l- like the, putting a uh, Kushner under a microscope. I think this is one of the best things that will happen. And I, you know, I was pro-Trump. You know this. Right. But now, I'm sorry, I see a lot of things that I don't like. And, and what s- are the things you don't like? I don't like the fact that, that he doesn't give the people who deserve the credit the credit he likes to take it himself. He's egotistical. Right. No two ways about that. Instead of spending all this time tweeting everything and downgrading everyone and just being a, a shithead, you know? I like that phrase. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I, I'm glad you didn't say ki- kiss his ass before, by the way. Um, it, it, he, he's... I understand it takes a business person to run the country because the country itself is a business. But there's a right way of doing it and a wrong way. I don't well, like the way that, that, that he and his people treat the press. Well, he's not a businessman in the normal sense of the word. He's accustomed to running a mom-and-pop shop. Mm-hmm. Um, he's accustomed to having a small business that, that surrounds him and which everybody rotates around him 
the way planets rotate around the sun. That's not the way major businesses work. Big corporations involve motivating tens of thousands and in some cases hundreds of thousands of people to be on target with a common goal. And he's never had to do that. He's simply put together businesses that make him a lot of money and that don't involve much in the way of administration. That's why he licenses his name. Um, hey, buddy, I hate to do this, but as, as always, whenever you're with us, time goes by so fast. Howard, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Look well, forward Rob, to speaking to you in the new year, buddy. You help make my, my holiday season. And you've made mine, my friend. Take care of yourself. Happy New Year, Howard, and I'll speak to you next year here in the Exo. Talk to you in 2018, Rob. Take care, my friend. Exonation for all the information on Howard Bloom. He's got YouTubes. He's got audios. Go to his website, www.howardbloom.net. We'll be back on the other side of the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. Don't go away.